It's rock and roll. <laughs> Welcome to the Look It's Rock and Roll podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today, I have a very special guest, author, musician. Um, what else can we add to your title? The uh, to Mach Bell from the Joe Perry Project, Mag 4, Thunder Train. Uh, what am I missing? Mechanical Onions, Last Man Standing, Mach 5. Cynic. I should have known that. I've got a Last Man Standing CD right here. So, Oh, man. Mark, thank you for taking the time to join us on this show today. Um, you've released, and I'm thrilled that you've put out this book, Once a Rocker, Always a Rocker. And it is the diary of your life on the road with the Joe Perry Project, 1982 to 84. So after 38 years, what pushed you to put out a book on your time with the band? Well, a few things. Uh, um Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you, that you enjoyed the, the diary. Uh, it, it, was, <laughs> it was time to do it, I guess. Uh, I, Aerosmith, when, when I was in the Joe Perry Project, for all I knew, Aerosmith was over. And if Aerosmith ever got together, you know, I figured they would see the same fate as other, you know, older bands from the 60s or 70s that would get back together. You know, they would still you know be out there rick derringer mountain uh lover boy whoever you want but they would certainly never regain the the glory of the 70s and man was i wrong in the 80s i was wrong in the 90s i was wrong and then you know by the time uh they were playing every night down las vegas uh a year and a half two years ago um and i get these calls from people writing Aerosmith books and they say, Ma, can you look in your diary and tell me the exact date that, uh, you know, Joe bought this guitar or when he and Billy did this or whatever, because I kept the diary that most rock and rollers, I guess, don't keep a diary. Um, uh, the news about this diary kind of made it to podcasters and one of your neighbors, Michael Butler at the rock and roll geek show, uh, searched me out um i wasn't that easy to find at that point a few years ago um but he had me on and i went on and on telling the stories about the joe perry project which was a really it was a funny band it was a funny band because we were uh in a van we didn't have much money we uh didn't have many prospects but we had this rock and roll superstar in our band Otherwise, it was like a high school band or something, the way we, we, we traveled, the way we lived. But um, anyway, Butler, after I finished telling a few of my tales, said, Cowboy, you've got to release that diary. And so I, I finally did. You know, it's, it's hard writing a diary. You know, you're writing something for yourself. Um, and a lot of these kind of rock and roll books and rock diaries or whatever that come out, the the guy who writes it no longer is friends with any of the guys in his band and he divorced the broke up with the girl he was going out with when he wrote the diary or you know all everything has changed. Strangely in my case it really hasn't <laughs> that didn't happen. I'm still very close friends with Danny Hargrove and Joe Pett. I'm married to the girl who is uh, living with me in the book. Uh, you know, 35 years ago. Um, so I, I think it's easier to write one of these rock and roll books when you're enemies with everybody and, and everybody's either dead or gone because then you can just like say what you will. Um, I certainly wasn't releasing this to hurt anybody, uh, but I also, you know, I wanted to be careful you never know how people are going to take certain things. And you know how it is with the written word. Um, they don't necessarily pick up little nuances. And uh, so these are all reasons it took me so many years, Julian, to re release the thing. I would think Man, I'd like to release it, but uh, would what can I tell this story? Would that upset Danny if I told that funny story about what he said uh, and things that happened? Would I be dredging up bad memories again? And, you know, I'd have this constant battle going on in my head um 
finally, you know, I, when I pulled the trigger, I pretty much just took the diary off the shelf. It's in a couple books, you know, the 1982, the 1983 diary, 1984 diary that cuts off when Joe suddenly decides to quit the Joe Perry project. Comes to a rather abrupt end, doesn't it? <laughs> Has a sad ending. Of course, for you and other uh, rock and roll experts, everybody knows where the Joe Perry project fit into the Aerosmith story. And everybody knows that, um, you know, in most Aerosmith books, it's like this sag in the middle of the book where, you know, everything's going great, you know, walk this way, draw the line, night in the ruts, and then, oh no, Joe leaves. And then, and by the time Cowboy Mark Bell gets involved, oh, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, this is triple X rated. It's so sad. It's just like, we don't even want to go down that road. And then, and then, then it goes back to the, you know, the tremendous uh, happy reunion of the band and all that. For me, it was the other, <laughs> my book, it's the other way around. I see Joe in the project as being uh, unleashed, unchained, unshackled, being able to go out there and just go where he wants to with his music, uh, interpret songs different ways, different nights, not having to answer to a lead singer or a production manager or to, um, you know, I, I don't know what Aerosmith uses these days. I don't know if they use uh, back backup singers or sounds or tapes or anything. And I wouldn't say they do that, but, but when you get tied into a big time rock show, there's certain marks you gotta just kind of hit. You gotta hit, you know, of course he's gotta play Dream On every night for the rest of his life and Walk This Way and Living on the Edge and all those songs. And, you know, you gotta hit them, the marks at the particular times to work with the whole big production around you. None of that was going on with the Joe Perry project. We were just, you know, the four of us and our tiny crew in, a, in the, the rock and roll dive down the street. Um, just knocking it out. And if we suddenly decided to play a uh, train kept a roll in half time or like a rockabilly tune, or let's take it like a psychedelic uh, Jimi Hendrix tune, we would just make it up as we went along. And the kids loved it. The, the guy, for the most part, the people coming to see Joe were either guitarists themselves or guys that just love guitar and love to hear s guitarists go off. And that's what the project was. So I was seeing this, uh, I was just looking at it musically. I'm sure the, the bean counters back at Columbia were going, geez, we used to be able to count on a Aerosmith or a Joe Perry record making us millions, you know, and now, you know, the money's not happening. We got to get that Aerosmith cash cow back together. Uh, you know, Cowboy Mark Bell's not doing anything uh, with this project. Um <laughs> <laughs> but meanwhile, down at the club, we're on cloud nine because we're playing, you know, manic depression and going into uh, bright light fright and just jamming it up. And, and I mean, he had the total artistic freedom, really, that you, you talk about. And what comes across in the book is that you were a band of pirates in a van, essentially, uh, that, that you really were completely free to, to go and explore. But I want to go back to the beginning. And you were in MAG4 in 1982. Um, I, I think you start the book out with a, a bit of what you were doing currently musically with your friends that you'd been in Thunder Train with. But Earthquake gives you that call. Why do you think he called you, of all people? Did you ever find out specifically why he thought you were the right guy to come down to the annex to rehearse? Yeah, that's something I wonder about earthquake and I had been together at that point for seven years or so. Uh, he produced records for thunder train. He had a lot of faith in me and, um, he got what I was doing. You know, a lot of people didn't get my act. Some people thought I was a punk rocker. Some people thought I was a soul singer. Uh, some people thought I was nuts. Um, I, I didn't come into this business as a singer, you know, I came in as a dude that likes to listen to rock and roll, likes to, you know, get into it and get down. And <laughs> I was a guitarist and then uh, I, I, I couldn't find a good lead singer. I needed a singer, dude. I knew that guitarists 
can't make it alone. You've got to have a singer. And I couldn't find a singer. I said, I guess I'm going to be this guy. I'm going to be this guy that goes out and is like the, what's that, that person on the front of a, of the Argonauts boat, you know, that's the bowsprit or the, the figurehead yeah. at the front of this musical thing. You know, I knew all these killer drummers and bass players and awesome guitars. But, you know, when they're just playing, they're just a bunch of musicians. But you, you got to throw a Peter Wolf out in front or a Steven Tyler or a Freddie Mercury. And just thinking, I mean, that's where the, your whole direction so much comes from whoever that guy, whether it's Steve Perry or if it's uh, Brian Johnson. The dudes behind, you know, most of these guys all know how to play all the Led Zeppelin tunes and all the Journey tunes and, you know, the, the, the project. You know, we could play Jimi Hendrix or whatever, but it's that guy out front that really puts a brand on it. And uh, Earthy got that that was what I do. And he knew that Joe Perry needed that, but also it was very tricky, Julian, because Perry had left Aerosmith with bad feelings um, for Stephen, most of all, I think. And I don't think Joe wanted to necessarily get into a deal like um, Jeff Beck did with the Jeff Beck group where he hired, you know, Rod Stewart to sing. And then all of a sudden, you know, Rod Stewart is getting all this press and like, where'd this guy come from? And suddenly the lead singer is stealing the spotlight. <laughs> Alyssa, <laughs> Alyssa was kind of on another planet when I joined the band, but she was, Joe, get Robert Plant to sing. You should have Robert Plant be your singer. Of course, Joe at this point was not in a really good financial position. I think Earthy might have been hip to that already. Certainly Tim Collins, the brand new manager, was. There wasn't a lot of money. They didn't have the money to get Robert Plant, if Robert Plant wanted to come join the Joe Perry Project. And they didn't really, you know, they just had Charlie Farron, the best singer in town. But the thing was, the record labels were all coming to Charlie and saying, you know, we'll, we'll give you a contract and you can do your own thing. You don't really have to, you know, be second fiddle to Joe Perry. Um, they said, Cowboy. Now, here's a guy that he would be second fiddle. <laughs> you know, he's not the best singer in town. He's not going to, like, take off like Freddie Mercury and, and overshadow Joe. It's going to be a good balance there. Um, I think that's and, – and they knew that, I'd, you know, I'd been out there playing five nights a week, making the gigs, doing it paying my dues. Um, so all those things kind of came into it. The, the one part of it that didn't come into it was after uh, Thunder Train, which was, a, you know, a big, we were the big frog in, in the pond uh, here in Boston. Um, after Thunder Train broke up, Mag, Mag 4, the band you mentioned that I was in when I got the call to if I would audition to join Joe Perry, Mag 4 was just the rhythm section of Thunder Train, my drummer, my bass player, and myself. And I had gone back to playing guitar and singing. So it was just, it was a power trio. I was closing down at that point. I was close, uh, closing down my uh, horizon. I mean, Thunder Train, I truthfully wanted to be, you know, the new Rolling Stones. And I didn't see any reason why we couldn't be as big as the Stones. I was, you know, I was young and dumb. This is, you know, 21, 22, 23, 24. You know, we're going to be the biggest thing. Um, when things didn't always go our way, when Atlantic didn't want to sign us, when Arista didn't want to sign us, when I'd be sitting there, you know, at Max's Kansas City with the, the heads of, of uh, you know, Sire and two other labels, and ended up not with no deal. This stuff started to wear on me. The uh, the doors being slammed in my face, the humiliation, the uh, watching these new bands come in and get swept up like Boston. Now who's that? They're singing this song. We're just another band out of Boston. Wait a minute. We never saw you play in any clubs. We never saw you guys paying any dues. I think you guys were all in the cellar somewhere cutting these demos, and suddenly, you know, they sing about <laughs> they're singing about what we are actually doing. But and 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 they're like, 
taking off and they're number one on the radio. And then, uh, you know, Hirsch Gardner's band New England came out of nowhere, did great. And then the Cars, my girlfriend well, is in the book and who's now my wife, was working for the Cars. And they had become the new biggest rock band in Boston now that Aerosmith was out of the picture. Uh, watching all this stuff happen, I had got to a point where I was kind of closing down and saying, okay, I'll still play. Mag4 was more of a, I wasn't looking at, at us to take over the world. We were just going to play, you know, fun, fun gigs around town. Um, and that's when I get the call to join Joe Perry. And um, it's hard when you uh, have done this change in your head. Um, I don't know exactly. I, I'd kind of, I, I was trying to extinguish the flame in my belly. But then when I got the call, I, it freaked me out. And it seems like in the book that you, that you resisted that call. You know, you said, no, not interested. And he calls back and says, yes, you are interested. You know, uh, learn these songs and come down. So you get down to the annex. You, I love the visuals that you paint with your, I mean, it's a diary, but you paint a visual that we can follow, that you get there, you see the cars, you hear the guitars, and and Danny comes out, and I guess you you knew Danny from the scene at that point, so that that probably was a bit comforting or familiar at least before stepping through those doors, and you see Joe Perry and Brad Whitford <laughs> practicing with Ronnie. Um, what was your first impression? Number one, that's that's Aerosmith's guitar line on stage in front of you. I mean, what? what to a guy who was living in the area, what did that mean to you to walk through those doors and actually see that? Um, <laughs> I had been in awe of these guys uh, from when I first saw them at Hopedale Town Hall. I had seen Joe play with Aerosmith before Brad had joined the band a couple times, and then I'd seen when Brad joined. Um, probably the first gig that Brad played with them at Joe's hometown, Hopedale, they were at the town hall. Um, and from the beginning, they were superstars as far as I was concerned. Um, you know, years before they got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and before they became million sellers, it was so obvious that these guys were just so many levels above anything that was happening locally and in the States, as far as I was concerned, I, I was big into the British rock bands. We had a lot of them coming through Boston in the late 60s, early 70s at that point. This is 71 I'm talking about. So, yeah, I mean, so I had that. But being in Thunder Train, a five-man rock and roll band out of Boston, I also had this thing where don't yell Clay Aerosmith at me, you know, when I'm on stage. Hey, play some Aerosmith. You know, I don't know. Uh, they were my uh, uh, competition, <laughs> even though Thunder Train was several echelons below. But as far as I was concerned, you know, that was where I wanted to be. So um, I was in awe of these guys, but I also resented these guys when I was in Thunder Train because they were competition. Uh, now that I had just spent I'd only had a couple of days. I got the call. They told me to learn six songs off the Joe Perry project records. I hadn't really been, I had never seen the project and uh, I'd heard a couple of, you know, they, they got a lot of airplay around Boston. So I'd heard some of it on the radio, but um, so, <laughs> so now I just spent three days, you know, over and over again with a Walkman listening to, to the Joe Perry project and, and yeah, walking in, um, and actually being in just, you know, a room and Joe is dressed like a damn rock star because he never isn't dressed like a, uh, even when, I mean, I've seen him with jeans and a t-shirt, but for some reason, you know, I look like a slob when I wear that, but Joe just looks like a damn rock star. But he, you know, he looked more like a rock star than, than that, than, you know, he had the boots, he, he was wearing the silk shirt, the whole thing. And, and then you turn your head to recalculate and there's Brad right next to him. And Brad and Joe hadn't been 
in public together now for a few years because Brad had stayed with Aerosmith through Night in the Ruts. And, and I think, you know, I don't know if he began the next album the, or not. Yeah, he, he started doing uh, uh, Rock in a Hard Place and then he left uh, to do the thing with Derek St. Holmes. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm seeing these two cats at the same time and they're playing. The, the, thankfully, this is the one thing that was good about Julian and the one thing that kept me grounded. They were in the middle of jamming when I walked in and I saw a mic set up for me. And now that's comfort for me. If I had walked in there if, uh, to do a little interview with Joe and Brad where they wanted to you know, ask me questions or something, I don't know, that would have been a whole nother thing. But to, but to jam some music, that, that gave me comfort. Nice. How difficult was it that the material that they gave you to learn, you were going to be, and you ended up being the fourth vocalist for the project, but the two that had recorded, obviously Ralph Mormon and Charlie Farron, uh, had different styles. And you have your own style. I mean, you go back and listen to Thunder Train. You're in your own u- unique ballpark as well. How difficult was it to get your lungs or your singing around those different styles from those uh, vocalists? Because both of them are, are great singers too. Yeah. This was another place where I was <laughs> way out of my depth. You know, with Thunder Train, we were an all original band. And even with my bands before that, um, uh, I'd never been much of a cover band guy. Um, and if I did other people's material, it was usually like really obscure tunes that most kids didn't know. So what? So I'm not good at mimicking. A lot of cover band singers are good at mimicking. You know, they can do a Paul Rogers voice or they can do a, a, a Mercury voice or whatever the song I can't do any of those, those things. I can't do dialects. I'm crappy at that. I just have this funny chipmunk voice that you hear here. But for some reason, when I sing, it's more like a Jim Dandy thing that comes out. And yep. uh, um, it is what it is. So, yeah, that was really tricky. And I didn't know what Joe wanted me to do. I didn't know. I didn't know what Joe wanted me to do or what I what his fans would want me to do. Do, do they want me to stand there and, and, and try to sing the Charlie songs in a Charlie voice and sing the Steven Tyler songs with a Steven Tyler voice. Um, I didn't know if they wanted that or if they just wanted me to go up there and rock out. Um, as I say in the book, it didn't really matter. In my head, I might, oh man, I'm hitting it like Ralph. To, oh, I'm really singing it like Ralph. And then I'd hear the tape and damn, it sounds sound like... <laughs> <laughs> But also to throw Tyler into the mix. I mean, wow, you must have PTSD after every show going through songs where you had all those guys to sing their material for. I mean, that's that's not going to be easy. Well, I, I say it all uh, too much um, for for my enthusiasts that listen to me but on, on podcasts, but I will – the the thing for most of these guys, you know, when Sammy Hagar comes into Van Halen, They go into the studio, they cut a new record with the new singer. And then when they go out on the road, they can mix it up. You know, he'll sing a few David Lee Roth songs, but he also has tunes off the new album that the fans have heard. Um, You know, I didn't have that in the project I joined and there was no mock bell record. Nobody knew who I was outside of the Thunder Train fans when we played New England, but uh, out in the world, um, uh, there was no record. So it was very weird. I think people would go and they'd expect to hear that see Charlie and David Hull from the second album. And then, Whoa, what happened? To, you know, half the band is gone. And who's these new characters, this black guy, Danny Hargrove and this goofy looking blonde guy. We don't even know his name. And, uh, and they don't sound like the record. <laughs> so you know, Danny and I couldn't wait to get a record out, but unfortunately no record came out for months. And no, but you, one of the things that I find really interesting from that is you join the band, essentially, and then you're into Blue Jay recording demos. I mean, that before you even play a show, you've recorded three originals that you detail um, you know, in the book, how 
some of those start being born. You go, you do uh, what was it, Going Down cover, and uh, one of Joe's old songs, First Ones, uh, First Ones for Free. So you guys had original songs already in the set from that first show. You had Black Velvet Pants, um, and Worlds Collide. So you may not have had a record, but you did at least have the benefit of having your own material in, I guess, in the set from that very first time you hit the stage in uh, Concord. Yeah, definitely. That's true. And that, so that was a double, you know, that was a double whammy for me. I, definitely, I liked having tunes that I could sing like once, you know, once a rocker and Black Velvet Pants. We had in the first week together, we got those two together. Now I had a song that I could sing that Steven Tyler had never touched, that Ralph had never sung. This was just a cowboy song. Even if the world had never heard them, I knew that I wasn't um, trying to copy somebody else's thing. And the other part of the whammy was I was trying to prove to Joe and the rest of the project and to Tim Collins, our manager, that I could produce, um, make songs happen with Joe, not just come in and say, hey, I got this great Thunder Train tune we should all learn. No, I was listening to Joe and I uh, adapted to what he was doing and created tunes. So you didn't think about persuading Joe to take a bash at hot for teacher or teenage suicide? <laughs> Come on, Joe, we'll do Teddy yours, one of mine. <laughs> um, I was so excited with the prospect of seeing a song with written by Joe Perry and Mock Bell attached to it. that I was like, dude, you, you got to take this and run with it as hard as you can. Um, so I didn't want to be wasting time doing old, old tunes from my other bands when I had a chance to write with, with the super. Yeah, and, and you proved him very quickly that you've got an ear for melody just with them jamming along. I love how you explain the songwriting process of how these things were coming together. And I'm, I'm not going to go into details or ask you about that because I really think people need to read the book or listen to the audible uh, version of it to get those stories, but no time for women, obviously wants a rocker, um, you know, and, and well, if originally it was Joe's decision to call it uh, No Time for Women, right? <laughs> yes. A, de a decision, that's a good way to put it. You know, <laughs> it was uh, out of the fog, you know. No Time for Women. <laughs> 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 so... You guys hit the road, basically. Um, I've, I've mentioned the, the first show you did in Concord. But Brad's in the band at that point. Was that ever discussed? Was he going to be in the band? Was he just passing time? Or was it just never discussed? He was just there. It certainly was never discussed with me. Um, it po possibly was between... Uh, Joe and and Brad or with Tim Collins. Um, I don't know if Brad was waiting to see what this project looked like or uh, how gigs came in or what. You know, Tim Tim immediately put us out on the road and, and we were working. The first gigs we did, we'd go out and just do weekends, weekend warrior kind of things to go out and uh, see how it went and then come back and, and, and tune it up some more. While those were going on, Tim was lining up the first big national tour. Um, and then just as the timing worked out, um, Rex Smith out in LA got in touch with Brad and needed Brad to come out to Hollywood and, and uh, work on some kind of musical project with Rex. I'm never sure what they ended up, whether that was an album or, or it, was, it was an album. He did a few songs he co-wrote and it didn't come out until 83. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he wasn't just kidding us and going off to Hawaii. To, to go oh, no, no, no. He, he really did have legit work to do out there. So, yeah, yeah you, you do places like Uncle Sam's, all the regional kind of joints. I think Coast to Coast was the first date of the, the main kind of tour you do five dates in a row you do may may 13th may 14th 15th 16th that's a lot of work i mean i know joe said that he wanted to work and that was part of the reason why he'd left aerosmith in the first place is that they just weren't doing enough work whether it was in the studio or on the road as a vocalist does that sort of schedule kill you 
Yeah. The, uh, for a- anybody out there that, that were, came to those uh, gigs, you remember how incredibly loud the Joe Perry project was too. You know, we were, I think we were louder than Aerosmith and they were a loud band. Uh, you know, Joe didn't like that Stephen would say, Joe, turn it down. I can't hear myself in the monitors. I wasn't about to do that. I didn't want to get um, the Steven Tyler treatment uh, and end up out of the band. So, um, it, so even taking out the, the schedule out of it, it was very hard to hear myself and know what was going on on stage. And I'm new to the band. And I don't know what's going, you know, I talk about in the book when I joined, they set up a, a, a microphone stand way over there on the side of the stage. And, and I did the, those first whole bunch of dates. When Brad was in the band, I was over on the side of the stage singing, uh, which I had never done. I was used to being in the middle of the stage. That's usually where a rock singer stands. Um, so now, right after uh, Brad left, Joe moved me into center stage and he went over back to where he normally would be in a rock band right next to me. And, uh, and yeah, we're working every night and we're not staying in, in the four seasons and going in luxury coaches. You know, we're just in the little van and staying at holiday Inn or the budget Inn, and uh, you know, no security, no, you know, handlers or people helping out you know, our, we had our crew, but they got our, their hands full carrying our gear. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a lot. Danny and I were hungry for this. So, you know, we weren't certainly not complaining and we were getting paid by the gig, not by, not for the week, not by the week, by the gig. So every time we played a gig, we were finally seeing some money, which we hadn't seen much of since we joined the project. Tim said, I'll pay you when you work. <laughs> um, and you're, and you're going to work an awful lot. Well, yeah. And that was the beautiful thing. We worked a lot, an awful lot. So, so that, that helped, but yeah, so that was, there was a recipe for disaster between um, uh, going out full bore like that right after Brad had left and Brad had been such a safety net for us musically Um he's just right on all the time and you can count on him. I mean, Joe's a genius too, but not necessarily somebody you can count on all the time. You know, he swings for the fences and and he usually hits a home run, but sometimes he misses miserably. And uh, Brad is there to cover that. And, you know, and it's awesome because that's what we want as the rock fans. We want to see that guy swinging for the fences. It's awesome to see Joe do that. But, um, So now Joe's having to like recalibrate. Okay. I don't have another guy now. It's just me. And and with the, with Charlie Farron, the singer before me, Charlie, you know, played guitar too. Yep. Um, No guitar. I'm just standing there shaking my tambourine. Hey Joe. So you'd played guitar in the past. Was there no, you know, kind of thought of giving you a rhythm role, you know, something to do other than the maracas? Yeah. the, The call the original call from earthquake was bring your guitar. And I listened to the tunes a little bit. Um, the thing is I've got my whole, uh, shtick that I kind of do as a, a front man, that it's all designed around, um, me and a microphone stand in maracas and the guitar doesn't really fit into that. Um, when I put on the guitar, it's like when Jagger throws on the guitar in the middle of one of the tunes, like Mick, why the hell are you doing that? Just let Ronnie and Keith do it. You know, just, just dance. Um, so yeah, I, I was hoping that I wouldn't end up having to play guitar in the band and Joe didn't want me to play guitar in the band. So, so that was cool. No, one of the things that's interesting about those, you go back and there's the Glen Cove video, you know, that, that circulates that we get a good view of the early project. I think you know, that's June or July uh, mm-hmm. after the hiatus. Um, yeah. And it looks like you're still not very comfortable on stage in terms of your position, that you're looking over your shoulder to where's Joe? What's do- you seem very, um, se- not sensitive, but aware of the star on the stage. Uh, I'm not finding the right word, but you, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're keeping an eye on him. 
Yeah, that was a that was a, always a battle, you know, because it was certainly nothing that Joe and I ever talked about. Joe and I didn't talk that much, you know. We spent a lot of time together. We did a lot of musical things together. Um, as you could tell, I blab on and on, and I would talk in the van about this and that and my adventures of my life. And Joe would listen to me, but we didn't uh, talk, and I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know what was what my uh, boundaries were on stage, you know, because in Thunder Train, I was one of those singers who, you know, leapt up on the amp line and, and ran out into the crowd and, you know, picked up girls and did all this, you know, nutty stuff. I didn't know if Joe wanted me doing that. That didn't quite, the, the project was a little, wasn't like a circus. It was, there was a, a level of, of coolness and uh, arrogance and uh, regalness in the way Joe presents himself that I didn't. So yeah, so I'm looking over my shoulder, exactly. And I was, and I, and yeah, you know, I hate, I, I'm glad that those videos exist, but yeah, that's from, uh, I had been in the band for four or five months at that point, but like you said, uh, a good part of that, a couple months of that, we weren't, we were out of action because uh, Joe took a terrible fall on stage, uh, on that first few dates that we went out on the road and, and it didn't work out well. And then we, we had to come back and, and, and Joe had to get some help. Um, so when that video that, that circulates, yeah, that's, I don't know, four or five dates into getting back on the road after. Yeah. That. You, you guys were fresh and he looks skinny. I mean, he just looks uh, like Jimmy page circa 75 yeah. uh, in terms of just being skin and bones, but the, the power, I mean, I, I love watching that video just because you see number one, what a tight ass rhythm section, Danny and Ronnie are, I mean, absolutely incredible backbeat there, but also Joe carrying all the guitar load and you, you are clearly coming into, you're looking over, but you're also learning how to work the Joe Perry project stage, which is really cool to watch. And the set list is fantastic. Even if you don't like the count into what is it? East coast, West coast. <laughs> you could hear, I cheated. I don't say in the East coast, I just East coast. West. <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do. Right. If Ronnie wants to do the little fiddlies, you know, never ever figure out his concert intro to that song. And it was all totally on my fault. I, I'm just, I'm a Chuck Berry rock and roller. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, uh, Ronnie liked to play along with Asia and King Crimson. And, and he was, you know, he, he understood other time signatures and, and he felt it in a much deeper way, obviously, than I did. So a few dates after that, you're in Venezuela. I mean, here, was that your first international trip touring or had Thunder Train ever made it, you know, to Canada or else outside of the States? Yeah, uh, you know, up here where I am in New England, we're next door to, to Canada. So, yeah, we spent a lot of time in Canada. But so, yeah, this was the first time that I'd gotten on a jet and flown, you know, to another continent to go down and, and to go to Venezuela with the project. And what a bizarre and beautiful uh five days that was it was um uh <laughs> it was like we were leaving earth and going to this other uh place where um um where joe perry was the he was the toast of the town literally with banners draped over the streets as we entered caracas with joe's face on them and uh, the limo driver turned on the radio and they're playing, you know, discount dogs. And then they're playing Walk This Way. And then they're playing Soldier of Fortune. These are all, you know, er uh, Joe Perry songs, um, one after another. And I realized that's all they were going to play on the radio for the whole time we were there. And we were booked in, we're coming from Boston where we're playing, you know, the thousand seat channel nightclub. Um, we're going to Caracas where we've never been and we're headlining the Poliedro, El Poliedro 20,000 seat arena, headlining two nights in a row and packing the place. Um, it was 
absolutely <laughs> mind bending and uh and everybody loved us and we were treated you know so well and uh it was just a well, I won't say it was a drag to come back to the United States. I mean, it was cool. You know, we we came back to uh, a great show at, a, at the Lowell Memorial Auditorium with Rick Derringer opening up. So it was, you know, I'm glad it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like going back to the, the roadhouse in uh, the bayou of Louisiana or, you know, with some of the, some of the rooms we played weren't quite as prestigious as, as others, but um, yeah, the, the South America gigs will will never leave me, and it just got weirder and weirder. And, and you know, if you've read that part of the book, it, um, somebody said it's um, uh, not psychedelic. They said it's a uh, oh darn, I shouldn't have gone down the road because I can't think of the word that that, that perfectly. Uh, um, it was like something from a Rod Serling Twilight Zone or something. It was so upside down. Surreal. Surreal. I think that was maybe go. the word that was used. Thank you. And you also got a song out of it. I mean, where you sleep at night, Adriana. That's right. Um, yeah. Tried to always get a song out, out of um, these experiences. And, uh, and that, yeah, that was a good one. Adriana. Yeah, it started out as when do I sleep and, and started out as more of an ACDC crusher kind of tune that uh, we played live a lot. Um, then I kind of rewrote the lyrics and went a different direction when we, we cut it in the studio. Uh, equally cool tune. Just um, just needed. Well, it, gave, it gave it a bit of funk. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I was looking for one thing about our record is it doesn't like get into one groove and just stay in that groove over and over again it's uh different rhythmic feels different uh tastes um uh you know you get the kind of acdc ish tune but you also get the kind of the country honks style of, of, of and as you said the chuck berry stuff with walk with me sally i mean that's what i loved when i got i mean i've got the cassette just in your honor of what you say about cassettes in the book uh, and Mr. Perry not being interested in packaging and how more teens are going to be uh, buying these. Well, that's all I could find back in 85, 86, uh, when I was looking for your albums. Um, when you're on the road, was there writing or was it, were you guys ever just jamming ideas, woodshedding stuff in the van or at sound checks? You know, how, how did that kind of work? Because you have a steady throughout 1982, you're steadily building up a catalog of your own songs and they're popping into the sets at different points in the year. Um, how did that kind of work creatively? Yeah. Um, we didn't, we didn't, uh, bust open the instruments in the van. Uh, we would wait until we got to the sound check, which was always at five o'clock. And often, Danny and uh, and Joe would start working on new ideas, and I would be taking note of where they were going with their riffs. Um, me, uh, being a diarist and a singer guy, I don't know singers. I guess. Part of the reason I kept a diary was because singers, we don't have to carry guitar cases, but sometimes we have these little leather bound books that we write stuff in, whether it's the set list for the band that night or our shopping list or our, um, in my case, you know, diary of what's going on, where we came from and where we're going and start writing ideas for song lyrics often uh joe and i both like to just um make lists of song names um joe shared some of those with me i share some with him we would uh just come up with names uh that is a really good way to spark a whole tune you know just when you can you know when you get a name king of the kings or four guns west or black velvet pants you're on your way to knowing, at least you can eliminate things that don't work with that uh, title and, and, and things start to, to cook. So yeah, uh, I'd be doing that. And, and uh, definitely, like you say, in Caracas, I'd be uh, a combination of taking notes, but also 
then turning notes into into lyrics for tunes. It's just part of the job. Right. And you cut the, your next batch of demos in November 1982 back at Blue Jay again. Um, let's see. What, they don't, they'll never take me alive. When do I sleep? Worlds Clyde. Once a rocker. Now officially known as Once a Rocker. And Walk With Me Sally. Black Velvet Pants. That was Joe's. How quickly did that one come together? Because, I mean, obviously it was the video for the album the following year. But uh, how did that one come together? And what are your thoughts on that song in particular? One of the more meaningful uh, collaborations, and it's interesting because my name's not on it, but still is one of my most uh, important ones. This happened um, in the first week. Uh, I heard Joe playing that plaintive riff. Uh, he was playing it when I walked into the, the rehearsal hall and he wouldn't let it go. He kept on playing it before and after uh, we jammed the audition tunes. And then when I came back the next time, there he is playing it again. Uh, I had written lyrics to the other riff that he'd been messing around with, which turned into Once a Rocker. And once Joe heard that, how that came together, he pulled out this blue book and handed it to me. He says, cowboy, there might be something in there. So I uh, brought that book home and went through it. And after digging through it, I found I love the way they look. I love the way they feel. And I can. And then the whole, come on, babe, and I'm made out of steel. Over the phone, looks real cool, but face to face, you lose control. And I'm going, whoa, there's a whole tune here. And I think this is going to fit that Stonesy country tune thing that Joe's been playing. And Joe wrote all these lyrics. So that was, <laughs> that was the beauty of it. Because Joe, at this point, was in a fog. I don't know what he was high on or what he wasn't high on, why, why he was the way he was, but he was even more blurry and out of it than, than, um, than he normally is. Uh, he was, I don't know. remember those old, uh, the, those Aussie shows they used to show on MTV living with the, uh, oh, God, yes. <laughs> you know, he was kind of like that. I don't know if it was like, I don't know. There was something that was out of balance anyway, but he could still play those damn riffs. That's for sure. So, so I come, I come in and I sang that song at the rehearsal with Brad, with the band and Joe just playing and he looks up and yeah. And to answer your question, it was so easy, Julian, it was ridiculous. He started playing the riff. I started singing and the guys could just feel where I was going with it. And I don't know, there might've been one place where we stopped. And then I said, let's take it modulated up here in this middle eight here or something. But basically we um, just kind of jammed and just the song wrote itself. But when we finished it and Joe got, pretty good song cowboy <laughs> I, I said yeah man you wrote that song Joe and that you know Joe didn't jump for joy because Joe doesn't jump for joy but you know he gave me a look and then when he realized I told him yeah those so lyrics all of those lyrics were in that blue book you gave me last night I I think it, it got through his skull which was pretty thick at that point but I think it got in it I just wrote a whole song here you know i've got a song that i can bring to the studio next week with my name on it and and i was so glad that i could give that to joe because he had done it all but he didn't know he'd done it and he didn't know how to put it together quite he needed he needed the cowboy to just put the pieces together a little bit and uh, so i was so happy because i thought that was something he needed right at that point but even though his, his, his name is on the song, you're still a big part of it because without you, it wouldn't exist. And that's, you know, that must, that must feel good, especially with it being the video. And I guess if there had been a single, it would have been the single, wouldn't it? Yeah, I know. It felt, it felt amazing. But yeah, that's another reason I wrote, I released the diary, Julian, so I can get these, <laughs> get these stories out because I don't know, the, the project in general is little known about the Joe Perry project and certainly about our part of it. The third, the third project, because this the, is the lost era. Yeah. It's much easier. And I've done it for uh, 
the Aerosmith book I've been working on to do 79 through 82. So when I saw that you'd done this, I was thrilled, number one, because I, I've done these touring histories with Def Leppard and Kiss. Um, and to get it firsthand from someone who was there is just fascinating to me as someone who's interested in music history and just hearing the stories of on the road and some of your deadpan stuff in the book, people got to read this because when cowboy deadpans, it's absolutely, it's really entertaining. I, I mean, you, you've really managed to engage people with this book. Um, but I want to jump forward to May, 1983 you guys finally have a record deal. You're doing a show as the Pagans at the Rathskeller that night, and you're going to go into the studio. What took so long for the project to get that record deal and to get into the studio? Was it all money or was it, uh, you know, were there other factors at play? Yeah, you know, that's, that's the part of the, the story that I, I don't know much about. And, 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 you know, you don't see in, in my diary. I'm much more from just the guy that has to, to go out there and sing every night and, how am I going to you know, manage to do that and, and get through the day and, and the adventures of the day? Why Joe was not getting either, uh, you know, another record from Columbia CBS, who he'd done so much for, for so many years, were they standing somehow in the way of another company picking him up? Uh, was there a, Julian, I don't, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it because I'd come from, you know, <laughs> trying to get my band Thunder Train signed uh, for five years and it was so hard. And I'd always say, geez, I wish I was one of these guys like Joe Perry that can just get any kind of deal he wants, probably get three deals <laughs> in an afternoon. And, and then joining the project and seeing how darn difficult it was for us to, to, to get, get signed. You know, I, I guess, you know, there were certain things about um, Joe's lifestyle in, in Aerosmith and, and continuing in the project that maybe were, were making investors nervous. Um, but it's, yeah, so there we were in May, a year and a half, a year and a half later, 100 whatever gigs later, and we're still looking that's at the, That's the part that shocks is it had Joe Perry not proved his reliability by making it through a hundred and something shows to that point. I mean, the project, you, yeah, uh, Ronnie leaves and Joe comes in um, that happens in bands. But other than that, the band was stable. You, there were, there were some cancellations here and there, but nothing outrageous. Um, well, there are a few outrageous things in the book, but uh, that's mostly the crew and not the band. Yeah. Well, there was definitely a lot of, <laughs> just stuff going but you know we didn't cancel um we didn't cancel shows uh after after joe fell and we had to cancel the rest of that initial tour but once we got back on the road uh in the summer of 82 man we made every date there were dates that canceled on us right here and there, but we would make it even when like you're saying even when the road manager ends up being called off to jail and Joe's guitar tech is naked up in a tree and gets dragged. I, lo I love the stories about the techs in this because that just, just illuminates life on the road that no one will ever understand unless you've been on the road. And, uh, oh my God. <laughs> but we still made those, even those nights, we, you know, we'd get kids, Joe Perry fans to help us carry the stuff in and we'd still rock, you know, because we weren't messing around. Yeah, so you finally get into the studio to do the album. Um, I want to ask you about one song in particular, and Women in Chains. How did that come to you guys? And what were your thoughts on that coming in when you had plenty of songs in, in the barrel? Yeah. Well, you know, we had so little uh, guidance from anybody outside that it was kind of interesting when this one A&R guy from the label that ended up signing us, MCA, flew up from Nashville to meet with Joe and this guy, Leon gave a tape to Joe and said, check this out. It might be something you could use on the record. Um, I think it was just, that was kind of cool that somebody even did that. I, 
I know that, you know, in the modern day Aerosmith, they had like a John Kalodner and these song doctors and, you know, all kinds of stuff going on that helps create, you know, project had nothing like that. Nobody said, you know, the end of that song's really good, but the beginning stinks. You should just cut off the beginning part. You know, nobody, sometimes it's helpful to have that uh, outside person. Anyway, so Leon, this A&R guy gave us Women in Chains and the original tape, um, the guy who sang it, uh, it sounded a lot like a police song. Police were really big at that point, 82. They were all over the radio. Um, so, you know, Joe thought it was interesting and he kind of redid the thing and made it his on a guitar. And, and then I really, you know, definitely don't have a sting voice. I don't know. I did some kind of uh, cowboy meets Alice Cooper voice on it or something. But yeah, I thought it was a pretty cool, cool tune. And, uh, um, I don't know. We did have some, the only thing bad about it was we had some dynamite other originals that, you know, that was a spot that we could have yeah, been. And you also put the T-Rex cover on, you know, you'd done quite a few covers. I mean, Red House was always in Joe's set from day one of uh, the project, but um, you had something else you had going down. Uh, I think there's a few others. Uh, I think Heartbreak Hotel had made it into a couple of sets. I don't know whether that was with you or with Charlie. Um, so well, just one thing about, I don't know if Joe analyzed it, but I was analyzing, listening to the radio at that time, 82, 83. And the only hard rock band that, um, you know, Van Halen was the biggest hard rock band at that point. To get on the radio, they were do covering like, Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Women, Woman and uh, covering Dancing in the Streets. Um, and I was thinking that, I guess that's how you either write a ballad, a dream on type tune, which I wasn't going to do, or you cover a tune. And I was thinking Bang a Gone could be a, a hit. And uh, the thing was, a few months after the project uh, broke up, Danny and I were driving and then we heard, we thought it was us on the radio. We heard Bang a Gong starting to play. And it was the power station. Oh yeah. Oh. And it became a huge monster hit. So the tune, the tune was ready to be back, but um You're but, just a little bit early. Yeah. <laughs> and without major support either, because when that record comes out, I mean, you do tell the story of the shenanigans and kind of the disaster that you know strikes with the label, but it gets released. And you know, it gets released on cassette, you know. Um and you get to shoot a video. I mean, that video has been, you were a big part of that video, weren't you? That wasn't that a lot of your idea. Yeah, I drew the storyboard for it. And, uh, and that was, you know, that whole video came from our end. It wasn't like our record company said, boy, you guys are great. We're going to throw some money your way and send a director out to make a video. No, it was not that. Tim Collins and Joe said, let's get, do a video and we used local production company and uh, local people. And we, you know, put the whole thing together. I wrote the idea of the story. Uh, they ended up filming it just like, you know, I drew it out a cartoon, you know, like a comic strip and, and, and filmed it. And uh, I knew that my up the street neighbor, Billy Alexander would be awesome in the role uh, of the blonde girl that goes to the Joe Perry project show and ends up, grabbing a saxophone and jumping on stage, and jamming on her pink sax with Joe. Um, and so that was, you know, there's, there's disagreement on, on, I told Joe when I wrote it and I drew it, I drew her in the cartoon. I mean, she was the person in mine. Joe says, no, no, I never, I never listened to you cowboy about that because I was looking, I went to Tim Collins office and we were looking through model books and for the right person. And then I saw this beautiful blonde. And I said, that's the one, that's the my saxophone player. And it was all me that came up with it. Joe speaking. Uh, so that's his version. Um, the, she was my neighbor and I knew she'd be right for the, for the role. And my brother, <laughs> my brother had an extra sax and Billy and I painted it pink out on her balcony with some spray paint and put it together. You know, you got, everybody has to write a book, I guess, to get their own version of the story out. But I'm telling you, man, my diary doesn't lie. 
<laughs> no, it's it's a hundred percent your perspective, right? And and it's you know, and I wrote it down when it was happening. You know, it's not like if I was asked to write a, a book about you know, Thunder Train right now, and I had to do it all from memory. Um, It'd be a cool book, but it wouldn't be the so same. So you, you didn't keep a diary for the Thunder Train years? I, I actually did keep a diary for Thunder Train years, but unfortunately a middle, very significant chunk of it was in my uh, manager's closet of his office when he suddenly lost the lease or something happened and everything ended up in a dumpster while I was out on the road. So um, I lost... A bunch of my uh, collection there but i i have enough and there's enough in the public record that that i you know i am working on on uh, on something for thunder train cool we we'll look forward to hearing that because that m- music's worth checking out as well for anyone who's not familiar with it you can go on youtube and uh find some of the the videos um and the material uh and of course get the album i think there you had three singles didn't you uh independent yeah, we did singles, and then we did the Teenage Suicide album, um, and we were also prominently on the Live at the Rad album, double album, came out in 77. So let's head into 1984. Yeah. And we're, we're going to head down the road here to the, to the end of this discussion today. Um, so 1984 comes around. The album's been out. It hasn't done a whole lot. It hasn't done terribly. And I, I know you do point out that 40,000 copies was a number mentioned way, way years ago. And there have been lots of, um, you know, re-releases and, and whatnot. But it didn't do the level of um, Let the Music Do the Talking or, um, God, I'm blanking on the second one, on either of the other. I've got the rock and roll skin. Thank you. So it also looks from your itineraries that your, your venues have kind of reverted back to smaller ones. Was there any point when you started thinking, "Uh uh-oh, we're in trouble. Aerosmith could come back into the picture or did you ever start talking, you know, about second albums or, you know, the future, but uh, what you, you, you detail how, you know, Joe breaks it to you that he's going to get Aerosmith back together. But were you blissfully unaware of everything as you go into the winter? I think he goes off and does a, a little bit with Alice, and then uh, you guys get back together and hit the road again. Yeah, definitely. I was I was blissfully unaware, and, and you know, I was working hard to be unaware. You know, keeping the blinders on uh, because you know, from the time I joined the band there were people saying, Oh, Joe, will get back with Aerosmith, you know, Stephen and Joe. Um, and that was not helpful to me to hear that or think about that. No, I had to think about this, my band now, Joe Perry project. And, uh, of course I was thinking about the next album. That was, you know, I, that was one of the reasons I was fine with having women in chains uh, and bang a gong on the album because, Hey, I can do uh, first ones for free or, or they'll never take me alive on the, on the next Joe Perry project album. I was already thinking about the, the next video and, and the, there was talk about more uh, touring out outside of the United States. Um, I, I understand the, the, I'm not sure the the gigs, you know, yeah, it's easier now, you know, when I look at it in the diary, I see, you know, what should have been happening right now probably is we move out of this level of venues and move up to the next level and the next level, but we're continually going to the same venue, uh, maybe doing two shows instead of one, but we're not we're not moving fast enough. And this is why business people were hovering around Joe and saying, dude, this is not working anymore. And we've got to do something. Um, but I was outside of that. Danny and I had both heard that Joe Perry was going to team up with Alice Cooper and they would go out on the road together. Alice would be the lead singer and Joe would be the band leader and they would do, you know, a bunch of dates, but this would just be a, uh, something to go out and make some bread. And then, Joe would return to his project and, and we'd go with that. That's, that's as far as I had heard. Uh, you know, Joe was still, <laughs> he would, you know, 
say things under his breath about Aerosmith and, and that whole organization that made me feel that nah, I don't think he's ready to go back to that. So I, I was shocked um, when Tim Collins broke the news to us. Tim had us come to the office. Joe, Joe was nowhere to be seen. Tim brought the band in minus Joe and told us the bad news that our leader was quitting his own band to go back with Aerosmith. Did you think it would work? I, I mean, you guys finished out your contractual obligations. I think Joe leaves towards the end, which brings in the very final lineup, which uh, in, includes Joey Kramer filling in on drums. Um, and it's sad. I, I, I mean, you, you read this part of the book and you just like, you guys have toiled in a van. You've been our matey. We're pirates of the road together for, you know, nearly two and a half years at that point. And then you get like the inevitable word that he's going back to his ex-wife. Uh, you know, he's chucking away the girl, the new girlfriend. It must have hurt. It must have hurt. I'm a rock and roll singer first and a writer second, but I tried to, to get it across in how I wrote it and how I tell it in the audio book, especially, I think you, the, yeah, it was, it was crushing. It was hard. Uh, sometimes now, nowadays when I think about it, Julian, sometimes I wonder, could have that have been part of why I hesitated when I had the call to join Joe in the very beginning? Could I somehow have been looking ahead saying, you know, you can ride this ride, man. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fast. It's going to be wild and crazy, but it's going to end. And when it ends, you know, are you ready for that? Um, and I wasn't. And Danny wasn't. You know, luckily for me, Danny Hargrove and I joined the band the same Danny the day before me. We left the project together and continued on as the Wild Bunch for a couple of years, and uh, we were a support group for each other. It's, it's a very, it's a difficult thing to go from being in a family, a pirate ship with, um, with Joe Perry and his great kids that follow him, the super fans, uh, to have that very exciting uh, lifestyle where you're hitting a different city every single night and uh, all that electricity and then just have it just you know you get I got out of that van that last night and then it was like Joe was with Aerosmith the very next day they were they were rehearsing together and you know I wasn't in his band anymore and the and the 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 dream ended yeah I had been waking up for the last two and a half years I'd wake up and go Oh, I'm the singer of the Joe Perry Project. Oh, I'm waking into this fantastic dream. This is what I had always. This is great. Now, now I would wake up and say, "Now, now you're just, you just mock Bell again." You know, the guy from Thunder Train, guy that had a shot, didn't quite have what it takes, I guess. But I, I, I don't, I don't think it was a matter of you didn't have what it takes. I think the band and the times. You know, it, it was always going to be Aerosmith, I think, because once Stephen and Joe had started talking again, I think it was inevitable. And they started talking again in 81. So they were having their regular chats by then. And business is business. I, I mean, it, it's expensive to be on the road, isn't it? You know, and it, it's the economics of being in a band are much more than making music. So true. And that's why, you know, a lot of people don't, understand yeah it's like wow these guys were out on tour for all year but there's no money where'd the money go well yes yeah, so much of it just goes in to keeping your band on tour uh even if you're just a small operation like the joe perry project which is basically a van and a a, a truck and uh you know eight guys out there but you're staying in hotels every night you got to be fed you got to uh you keep, you know, fuel in your things and, and strings on your guitars and the speakers fixed and uh, paying the salary for all these guys, even if it's a low salary. And, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, super expensive. And, yeah, I mean, you, I remember reading 
uh, you know, the, the Mick Jagger saying, we're going out, we're going out September 1st and uh, w me and Keith will see our first dollar on February 14th. I've got the, I've got a circle on it. You know, you need that many gigs ahead before there's money where the, the guy in the band actually makes something. You got to pay everybody else first. Yeah, you're kind of, you're kind of last in line. And Joe was shouldering all that pressure from October 79 to May 84. It was he was the band. I mean, he was the boss. So all that pressure was on him. Were you surprised that it worked out for Aerosmith on their rebirth? Oh yeah. You know, I thought, I thought the, the done with mirrors was terrific. I loved it. There was uh, Steven and Joe writing together like that, but you know where it went. I said, yeah, that's probably about where it's going to go. And, and, you know, good luck to them. It, it, they're going to be, you know, one of those oldie bands that we like. Then, then when a bunch of different magical things happened, the connection with Run DMC, which opened up doors for a whole kind of new kind of airplay they'd never seen before, and then the happenstance of getting that kid uh, Alicia Silverstone involved in the videos that came out, just when she was like coming up as a Hollywood star as well. And, and then, and then Steven's beautiful daughter suddenly shows up. All these things are like coming together. I'm like, Whoa, you gotta be kidding me. And, and, and uh, I was a little, you know, like a lot of us, it was weird when the song doctors and, and the outside stuff started all happening. And some of that wasn't necessarily my cup of tea, but they wanted to stay current and they wanted to stay in the top 10 and not just be, you know, like, a, uh, you know, you know, mahogany rush or whoever, some, something from the olden days They reinvented themselves. And I couldn't, you know, I still can't believe it. And yeah, they're, they're a band that's had two separate and distinct careers. You know, you got 85 and before, which is, you know, the only era I'm interested in, and then 86 onwards. It, it really is. They made the most of that luck, but they also had a lot of luck, you know, uh, but they, they took every opportunity. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess it was luck. I, I, always, want, I always wonder, I used to ask about that, you know, how did you get, those actresses into those videos. And I mean, the synchronicity of it all is just blew my mind, but, uh, but Hey, God love them, man. It's great. And it was only this uh, pandemic that slowed them down. Otherwise they were just, you know, going to march straight out of Vegas and then do the European tour. And I guess they still will. It's, it's tough to, <laughs> I don't envy. I mean, they deserve everything they get. Cause I don't envy, uh, being uh, having to sign those contracts for these dates uh, in 2023 or whatever, way off in the distance that they're doing right now at this stage in the game where they're at, you know, yeah. it's especially Steven because the athleticism involved in what he does as a singer, uh, you know, those are not songs you just warble you know, each one of those is like pole vaulting and with, you know, he wrote these really tough uh, obstacle course type vocal parts for himself to do. And we love to hear it, but man, he has to do it. It's well, crazy. for all of them, it's a full day's work packed into two hours at night, you know, with all the other things that go along with it, as you're experiencing this very second, including the press, the publicity and everything else. I, I'm, it is brutal. Steven's going to be 75. Yeah. You know, and Joe's just a you know, few years behind him and the whole, the whole, you know, come on, this pandemic's been bad for music and the industry. And I, I can only hope that we, we, oh, you guys, musicians recover from it. I can only, uh, say, I can only say that the, 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 from the beginning, the Aerosmith always uh, modeled themselves on the Rolling Stones and, the Stones are still doing it. So, and then Mick is five years older than Steven. So Steven's saying, if Mick's still doing it, I'm doing it. You know? Hey, who knows? Anything is possible, right? You know, and bless them all if they can, as long as they can to do what they want and to be able to do it well. Uh, you know, I'll pay to go and see them whenever I can. All right. Cowboy, Mark Bell, 
I think that's a really good show. And I, I want to thank you for taking the time to relive your memories. I want to remind everyone to check out the book. It's on Amazon. It's in stores, uh, online sellers, all over the place. Uh, the Audible version is, is available. Where can people find you? I live at onceyourrocker.com. Come to onceyourrocker.com and I will be there. All right. Cowboy Mark Bell, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Be well and stay safe in this pandemic as we get over it. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe to us, like us, or even leave us a review. You can find us and join the conversation on Facebook. <laughs>